Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, mindful it's the very last session of two very long days. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for hanging on in there and coming. Um, my name is Katie Kushakshi. I do communications um, for AITA as well as coordinate our Australia New Zealand task force. Um, so our panel today, we're going to talk about the role of carbon markets in financing net zero. Um, we're hoping we're going to have a very lively discussion. I'm going to invite each, each panelist to, I'll give them a question, they'll give you know, a couple minutes of remarks, and then really, I want them to basically do all the work and talk amongst themselves. Um, but yeah, so just a bit of comments for context. There's obviously um, growing numbers of financial institutions committing to net zero, um, including in their investment portfolios. Um, but they're also very active in advocating for carbon markets. Um, so it's kind of looking at how those carbon markets can help them achieve their net zero ambitions. Um, there's obviously different pathways to reach net zero. Um, and so for the session, we're going to hear from representatives from different parts of the market um, talking about, you know, from their perspective. Um, so our panel today, at the very far my left, we've got Brett Orlando, who's the Managing Director, Global Head of Commodity Transition at Bank of America. Um, next to him, we've got... Gotcha Mehta, who's the Senior Manager of Global Hydrogen Stakeholder Platform at South Pole. Uh, immediately to my left, I've got Guy Turner, who's Founder and CEO of Trove Research. Uh, on my right, I've got Mikael Larson, who's the CEO of Climate Impact X. And then in the end, we've got Gordon Bennett, who's the Managing Director for Utility Markets at Intercontinental Exchange. Um, so I think uh, we'll maybe turn to Mikkel first to um, just give us a little bit of context and explain you know, the, the potential role for Asia in meeting net zero. Well, thank you. It's obviously a wonderfully big topic to get into. So um, maybe start off by stating some of the perhaps obvious things that we all know, which is that to solve climate change, solving the carbon footprint of Asia and the corporates that are within Asia is an absolute requirement. I think that much most of us would know. And I think what most of us would probably also know is that if you look at those companies in Asia that have set themselves targets, including those on the science-based target, it's still a growing number, but it's certainly a minority of those globally. I think the latest count I saw was 600-something plus of those, mostly in Japan. What is perhaps less well understood in the context of carbon market is a lot of the most amazing solutions to some of these problems also is going to emanate from Asia. Nature-based solution has always been the thing that we focused on for good reasons. There's some and great projects being developed here in Asia, either project red or increasingly what we call jurisdictional red. But I think few people have really started to appreciate that many of the other solutions, be they biochar, be they decommissioning of coal-fired power plants, and all these solutions is also going to come from here. So I think that Asia in the next decade is going to be have an outsized role to play not just in the reducing its footprint, but also to provide some of the solutions. So if you think about the numbers, I think in Southeast Asia, it's about something like $10 billion, the opportunity, and that's, of course, just a very, very large number, but it does tell you something around Southeast Asia's role here. Despite of all of that, I find it to be amazing, if I can use that word, that none of the institutions that you need to create a well-functioning carbon market are here in Asia. We lacked, or until recently lacked, many of the components like the financiers, the legal expertise, the exchangers, the standard setters. And many of these uh, constituent parts were not actually there to create a value chain. But it's starting to happen, and it's encouraging it's starting to happen. We are one part of that value chain, and our mission really is to try and get new types of carbon credits to market, get them in fair price, and hopefully help them scale. Um, if you start to look at the carbon prices that we see, it tells you something about the problem when one carbon credit sells at $4 and another one at, what, $400, um, just to give you a, a wider range. And the problem is, of course, that they're not at all the same, and many of us believe that this market will commoditize, but it won't happen just tomorrow. And we need to understand and price correctly these, all these differences, whether you call them co-benefits or core benefits or whatever you choose to call them. Um, and there are different mechanisms to doing that. But I think fundamentally, and then I'll stop my rambling here, is whatever we choose to do, we've got to avoid having made some of the mistakes we made first 
time around by building a market that made a fast buck and didn't have much integrity in it. And I'm not pointing to everybody for that, but there are certainly some weaknesses. So for me, it's about creating integrity in the products. So something about the quality, integrity in the use of the product, integrity in the execution from all of us who's on this panel, and, and then integrity ultimately in the right prices that we have so that people know what they're buying and what price they're buying it for. So I'll, that'll be my opening remarks. Brilliant. Thank you, Mikhail. And that's a really good point as well that, you know, everything that we, Asia needs for Net Zero, it is here. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Asia Society Policy Institute, Asia Policy Society Institute. Um, they did a really good report a couple of months ago about Net Zero in Asia. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth a look. Um, you know, Asia is responsible for like half the world's global emissions, so we're not going to get there without addressing what's happening here. Um, Gordon, kind of maybe building off of that, building off of Mikhail, um, you know, getting a bit more into the nitty-gritty about how carbon markets can facilitate the transition to net zero. Um, you know, again, in Asia, you know, Mikhail hit on there's a lot of, you know, price disparity in voluntary markets. Um, but more broadly speaking, how can that mechanism be used? Yeah, so um, net zero is a, a very complex um, it's a very complex question to, to, to answer succinctly, but, you know, so ICE is a financial institution. Um, we're a financial infrastructure provider. But when we are thinking about the role of carbon markets and, and, and net zero, we kind of break it down to science, economics, and, and markets at the end. Um, ultimately, why we're committing to net zero is based on science. There's a finite atmospheric carbon budget if we want to travel down a, a temperature pathway. And so the carbon budget is the, you know, the sum of, is the carbon cycle, so it's carbon in and, and carbon out. Uh, and so we need to put less carbon into the atmosphere and we need to take more carbon out. Uh, I think there's a good argument that we've been mispricing the production and consumption of energy since the dawn of civilization because we've been treating the atmosphere as if it's free to use it. Um, and also we, we haven't put a value on conserving and preserving nature. So from a, a CO2 out perspective, natural carbon sinks are, are, are the technology today that, that can do that. So the, the, the problem that we're solving for is pricing the externalities. And so the economics that's in economic theory, externalities. And the role that, that we play is we have, you know, we're the largest global environmental marketplace. Our role is to value externalities, both positive and negative. So if you start paying the tolling fee for using the atmosphere, then that should incentivize abatement of, of emissions. So people need to start thinking about um, recognizing their emissions footprint as a liability and then, and then paying for those. And the other, you know, it's not just carbon markets, it's environmental markets because renewable energy certificates, for example, is really pricing the, the positive externality of not contributing to the carbon budget. And that's really measuring the supply and demand imbalance of, of, of renewable electricity. So, and then when we move into carbon credits, going into the nature, like a nature-based carbon credit is valuing the positive externality of, of capturing and storing CO2. Um, so if we can start putting externalities into business models, then hopefully we can start allocating capital that's, that's more in, environmentally positive. And I think coming from Europe, we've shown in the past that if you start to price uh, the, the negative externality of pollution, you, you, you do abate emissions. So regardless of what's going on currently in, in European energy markets, but coal in particular in the UK has, is out of the merit order in electricity generation, and that's largely because uh, you've had to pay for every ton that you emit. And so I think that without carbon markets or without environmental markets, without recognizing externalities in business models, we're making net zero very difficult and, and almost it's really abstract in nature. So you need, you need price signals to allocate capital, and, and we're trying to provide 
price signals for externalities to reallocate capital. Well, thank you, Gordon. And that actually um, is an to maybe segue to Brett to maybe talk about, um, you know, Gordon was talking about putting those price and those externalities and having them on your balance sheets or business models. How can financial institutions help with this? And how, you know, how are financial institutions approaching their own net zero pledges and commitments? Sure. Thank you. So a bank's role in this is really to deploy its capital to help facilitate the transition and facilitate companies to make those investments that will lead to lower carbon businesses. Um, we do that through bond issuance. We do that through underwriting financing deals. You know, we as a bank have made a, you know, one and a half trillion dollar commitment into investing in the energy transition by the end of the decade. Um, and we have our own net zero pledges and we're, you know, starting, we'll start reporting on our financed emissions, which are scope three emissions. But to build on Gordon's point, you, you need a price because it's very difficult to stop doing something that's profitable on goodwill alone. You need a way to value um, the emission side of the equation and to build that and so that emissions can be properly valued as a liability on the balance sheet. And if it was carried on, on the balance sheet, then you would find more behavior being incented. Um, I mentioned the commitment we've made to financing the transition. All of that still needs to generate a return. Um, it'll be a lot easier to generate the return if I can value the negative of the carbon. So I just kind of want to follow up on that, Brett. Just to be clear, and actually anyone else, feel free to jump in on this one. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about you know, using carbon markets to send those price signals in Asia, but are we talking about voluntary carbon markets? Are we talking about Article 6 mechanisms? Um, you know, the economic realities here are very different from, from Europe. And, you know, the demands that these countries are facing in this region with, you know, growing populations, growing, you know, economic growth. How can, how can the carbon markets kind of address that and still be pushing to net zero? Do you want me to do that? Yeah. Anyone who wants to check in? Don, you want to well, I was, um, I was going to sort of like broaden the question out if I could and sort of go back to the... Um, the subject of the session, which was like carbon markets, like it's the market piece. So the pricing of the carbon is is absolutely necessary. But I think um, for me, the important word in this title is the market. And what can the market drive? What can the market deliver here that other mechanisms can't? And I've spent sort of 20 years building and designing market-based mechanisms for climate change and other, other examples. And what I've observed, both personally and you know, the, the, the literature sort of supports this, is markets are an incredible catalyst for innovation. Innovation for finding opportunities to do things that regulators can't. I started out my career um, working for the UK Environmental Protection Agency, um, control, designing the, uh, the regulations on, uh, for pollution control on industrial plants. And my job was to say and research and define the equipment that needed to be added to the factories so that they could reduce pollution. And I would probably have my hand on a heart and say, the industry was better at it than I was. And what we should have been doing is setting the parameters for those, uh, those emissions and letting industry solve for themselves because they're far more creative and far more innovative. And every time that's happened, you look at the literature on um, environmental markets, pretty much without fail, prices have come down in those markets faster than the academics would have predicted. And the reason is that innovation has been driven and been incentivized. And we need to harness that. It started in the US in the 80s and 90s with the USSO True Trading Program, which Dirk worked on in the corner there um, and was the main architect. And you look at this, the ex-ante studies, and they said, what's the price of a sulfur dioxide credit going to be? They said it would be X. When it turned out, when they implemented the scheme, the prices ended up being half what it was because they found ways to reduce emissions much more cheaply through low sulfur coal, through abatement, and through new fuels that they didn't think they existed before. And that's the level of creativity that we need. And these markets work. They're resilient. In spite of the variances in fuel prices, uh, economic conditions, 
and financial crisis, the, U the European Emissions Trading Scheme has reduced emissions by 1.75% every year. That's the cap. Prices have, vol prices have moved up and down, but the cap has relentlessly moved down by 1.75% every year for the last 10 years. It's now 18% lower than it was. And that's predictable, and it will do that for the next 10 years. So you have predictability in a well-designed market. And everywhere you look, where markets are set up correctly, they drive huge um, creativity and innovation under the clean development mechanism. Some of the projects that happened under the CDM um, have sort of now, in the fullness of time, sort of been uh, tainted with a bad, with a, with a different brush. But when we, those who lived through the clean development mechanism days, saw billions of dollars being raised in projects and now finding ways to reduce HFCs, nitrous oxide, landfill gas, methane. When you get the power of money to drive innovation, it's really powerful. And the, the, these brains, the traders, you know, on, on ICE and, 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 and everywhere else, and, and in the banks, they find ways to do things. They allocate capital incredibly efficiently. They seek out the tiniest opportunities and, and scale them. So for me, the exam question is, how do we expand the use of markets to drive this? And I think the, 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 the history shows it's, it's an incredibly powerful mechanism. Well, OK, yeah, I thought maybe trying to answer the question also about should it be voluntary market or compliance market, I think, was your question. I think it's not either or. I think it's both. And a, a little bit more color around that. Um, we have started to see compliance market in Asia, not with the highest of carbon prices, but they're rising. There's all kinds of good reasons for that, of competitiveness in countries who are still pretty much struggling to get out of social um, degradation. So it's understandable that they don't raise the price maybe as fast as you would see some emerged countries do. But the second reason which I find much more compelling is, is what I started with is some of the best solution for climate change, and you explained it very well about the balances, they're gonna come from out here, but they need an international audience. So to have local compliance market is never gonna be efficient from a global point of view. So, and I think Singapore, again, I keep saying the same thing, but Singapore is a good example of why there aren't gonna be two markets potentially in the future, but one, because as soon as you start to think in terms of surrendering carbon credit from the voluntary carbon market into a compliance scheme, you have a market, and Singapore was brave enough to do that from 2024 onwards for only 5% of the carbon tax. But it's that kind of mechanisms that I can see could work elsewhere to allow a truly global market. So I hope that's gonna happen for Asia because they certainly need people to buy the, the carbon credits. Yeah, well, if, uh, I think in an ideal world, you'd have a global cap and trade program, um, but that's not happening. So therefore you do need credits. Um, you need carbon credits. The the the, the the difference is that in a, a government mandated program, you know, that you've effectively got a, a government issued currency, the permit that you that you have to buy and to pay for your pollution. And if you don't, then you get fined. So there's a penalty. Um, in the carbon credit market, it's not government issued currency and there's not really a penalty. That that's the challenge. Even if you set out to compensate for your emissions. If there weren't enough credits around to buy, then there's no real penalty today for not doing it. Um, so that's a challenge. But I, I think also what's missed quite a lot in terms of carbon credits, there's a lot of stones thrown at carbon credits, but what's missed is that, so first of all, you're buying an asset, you're buying a carbon saving, it's a reduction or removal. So it's atmos atmospherically additional reduction or removal. But you're buying something, so it's costing you. So you're paying for your negative externality by buying a carbon saving, and so you're putting the discipline of paying for your pollution through your businesses. So you don't need to rely on government mandates, and I think this is an important point as well. We can't rely on government mandates because they're not necessarily gonna come, and we need to live in a world where mandates come from other stakeholders. And this is why we, at ICE, we really try and avoid the compliance voluntary buckets because dealing with climate risk shouldn't be an opt an opt-in you know so it, it's just another environmental attribute a credit just measures something different but it allows you allows you to pay for your pollution and and that that, that that's really important in terms of financial institutions who can who can charge the penalty or do the 
incentivization to be a, a good actor outside of governments. I do that. It's it, for me. I think the capital allocators can play a, a a big role. So you know whether it's paying you're you're paying a cheaper coupon on your on on your um, on your debt. Um, that, that for me is only one of the few ways of of incentivizing people to change their behavior. There, there's got to be um, some sort of penalty for not for not complying with your commitment to your stakeholders. Like right? in the same way that if you are doing your you know your earnings guidance, uh, if you miss your earnings guidance, there's consequences to that to that. So if you're you know preparing your transition guidance. Uh, which hopefully in includes compensating for emissions, and you miss it, then there kind of needs to be consequences for that in order to change behavior. I don't know if you wanted to come back on that at all, Brett, or... Well, only to, only to comment that, you know, 20 odd years ago when we thought, you know, that the beauty would be the, a global cap and trade program, um, we didn't get that. Uh, but what we're actually finding is that in the evolution of the market that the carbon credit is the fungible asset because the carbon credit's the asset that actually be deliverable into many different situations, right? Whether that's voluntary or into a carbon tax scheme or into an emissions trading scheme, you know, or for a general impact investment, right? Um, that's, the, that's the value that, that that asset brings to the table which we'll probably not ever see with, the, with cap and trade programs because of the inability to link them for a variety of you know, practical reasons. Hey, I thought we've been talking quite kind of, you know, maybe esoteric idea. I kind of like to get a little bit more into some implementation, like how, how are we actually using carbon markets to finance the transition? And so there's a lot of talk, you know, Guy, you brought up this you know, notion of, you know, using markets to finance innovation. Um, Gotcha. I was wondering if you would be willing to talk a little bit more about some of the work that you've been doing to finance a much-needed technology, or trying to use the carbon market to finance technology development. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, exactly. So there are a few things. Like One is there's, of course, the shortage uh, of the market um, and the, the challenge to decarbonize. So we, we came to this topic of hydrogen, which I'm going to talk about um, at South Pole, um, with the same idea that we've been discussing. So a lot of the hydrogen projects, hydrogen is, has been you know, positioned as the missing link in the climate, um, climate change challenge, especially for hard to abate industries. Uh, but we have seen a lot of announcements in Europe uh, where you have um, an emissions trading system um, and a lot of pressure on the end use sectors, the sectors that are going to use hydrogen um, to decarbonize as they go under um, the ETS because previously they had this free allowances and these sectors are suddenly going to pay a carbon tax and they, they needed to you know, decarbonize and th there's your hydrogen. Um, so when, I, when we looked at all the announcements, they were coming from Europe um, where you have an emissions trading, where you have like a monetary value of uh, emissions. Um, and elsewhere, it was really slow. Um, so one, one problem here is the green premium because producing hydrogen uh, or products with hydrogen today costs a lot more than uh, your fossil-based products. Um, there's a reason for that. One is electrolyzers. To make hydrogen green, you need to have an electrolyzer. Uh, and one megawatt capacity could cost around one million euros. Uh, and you need a lot of that. You need like gigawatt capacity to decarbonize steel, to, to de decarbonize ammonia used in fertilizers in our food system. Um, so, of course, carbon credits cannot close all the gap, but technology credits uh, on hydrogen um, can actually narrow that gap. So with that mind, we, we started looking at it and we realized, of course, there's no methodology. Um, so we brought together Vera Gold Standard Perspectives Climate Group um, and, and initiated uh, um, something called the Hydrogen for Net Zero Initiative. So I'm leading that uh, from South Pole side. Uh, so we have, uh, now we're collaborating with the industry. So we're looking at um, actual projects um, and running, of course, writing the methodology against the baseline. 
Um, and we have a time frame, let's say, about two years to cover uh, different applications. And not all hydrogen uh, projects will generate credits um, because some of them will be used in Europe. But Asia becomes very interesting, Middle East becomes very interesting. Uh, and not all hydrogen credits will have a nice story. But it's, it's really important to, 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 that I share with you, especially we've selected um, initially ammonia. Um, as a sector to write the methodology for. Um, so when ammonia will be in the market 2024, green ammonia. And it's really important because it's going to help decarbonize our food uh, and f um, farming sector uh, in Brazil, in, you know, in Latin America, in Africa. Uh, but at the same time, like address the food crisis and energy crisis, because today all the fertilizers come from Russia and they are like oil based. Um, so the projects we are working with are addressing that, that crit critical issue. Um, so that's why we believe that the market for hydrogen credits will be there. Um, these are technology credits. Um, they will be accurate, more accurate in most cases than nature based. Um, yeah, and then we've been also at South Pole doing a similar approach to CCS. So this is our second initiative of similar type. Um, yeah, uh, I wanted to mention that. And, and I also should mention that we are already seeing buyers being interested, especially that are like across the supply chain. So you have aviation and leasing um, that are interested in not just buying, you know, a forest credit, uh, a tree, but actually investing in long term, making hydrogen cheaper and more available. So these hydrogen credits are also catering for that purpose. Hey, thank you, Gotcha. Um, and I think that is a really good point as well. I mean, um, you know, Guy, you mentioned as well under the CDM, you did see billions of dollars coming. Um, and you mentioned, you know, HFCs and in industrial gases, but it was also a lot of renewable energy. Um, obviously, given the way renewable energy prices are now, you just you can't use the carbon markets. There's no justification. Do, you know, Gordon, you mentioned earlier maybe having like a REX market for renewable energy. Again, do you think there's still a need for a financial incentive for renewable energy, be it a carbon market or a REC? Uh, well, yeah, 100% on, on, on renewable energy certificate measured in megawatt hours. Um, I'm not a proponent of converting something that has no carbon in it into a CO2 unit. But um, the, the, the point on the green premium is, is, is perfect in that the objective is to erode the green premium to allocate capital um, to, to the, the more environmentally friendly technology. And, and electricity is a, is a very good point. And you do it from both sides of the coin. So, you know, if you are making electricity through burning hydrocarbons, you make it less profitable by charging for the pollution. So, so you're reducing the investment case and burning the hydrocarbon. And if you value the positive externality of not contributing to the carbon budget through the REC, then you're increasing the profit of the renewable generator. So every generator is getting the price of the commodity, electricity. The hydrocarbon generator is having to pay, pay more and reducing its margin. The renewable generator is getting this extra sort of cream on top, making it more profitable. So you're building the positive investment case for the renewable generator. Um, given the supply demand imbalance that we have in renewable electricity, then yes, we need the REC. A REC needs to be a, a product that is, is in the, the solution, the box of tools for for net zero, you know, what, I, don't, I don't know, maybe it's 20, 20 to 25% of the world's electricity in, is in renewables. Um, you know, people are saying we're going to have to sort of electrify everything, and that needs to come from renewables. So there's a massive supply and demand imbalance. So RECs should be worth an awful lot of money, reflecting that, that supply demand imbalance. And so they're, they're, they're key. Can I pick up a point? Um, I agree with Gordon, and, um, and, and that's, that's exactly how it sort of works and should work in developed economies um, where you price in the pollution. Um, I think where it intersects with the carbon credit world is in the, um, the developing world or the least developed world, um, where the opportunity to put in a tax on carbon um, uh, sort of doesn't really exist. In fact, a lot of least developed countries will be subsidizing fossil fuels. Um, and the, the credits are still available on Fair and Gold Standard for doing renewable energy projects in the least developed countries, and these are very, very poor countries. 
um, where uh, you know the go-to pro- the go-to um, technologies are often you know diesel um, genserts, and um, uh, you know to overcome that and work in these politically unstable countries and get them off. You know, wean them off those fossil fuel cheap, uh, you know, cheap to build, expensive to run sort of fossil um, uh, power generation uh, technologies does require effort. Uh, you know, you're looking at forty, fifty, sixty dollars a ton of CO2 to overcome the the lending risks, the the operational risks, and, and every all the difficulty of working in those countries. Um, and you know, I think those are those are good opportunities for for carbon credits and sort of feed into the into the broader system. But I agree with Gordon that you know in the developed world, you know, price the pollution, and everything else should sort of find their own, you know, their own opportunities. Yeah. Brett, gotcha. You were both looking like you might want to chime in there as well. Um, yeah, go ahead. So I did just want to build on something that Gordon mentioned, um, and it's unpopular to say it, but uh, renewables are still additional. As long as you have a grid that's still dominated by coal it's renewables are still an additional thing. It may, maybe it doesn't fit the narrow definitions of a financial additionality because on a project basis, renewables are profitable. They do generate healthy returns. But there is a reason why they don't penetrate into a lot of these, into a lot of markets. Um, and, in that, and there are other barriers, non-financial barriers, that stop renewables from penetrating deeper into the grid and decarbonizing the grid in all kinds of jurisdictions, even in Europe and in the US, that is the case. Um, so I, we need to, I think, rethink and reframe the way we're thinking about additionality and how can we reframe the way markets can help drive, continue to drive renewables further into the grid to help decarbonize it. Can, can, I, can I just say that in terms of, so I agree with that 100%. I, 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 the, the sort of um, grabbing onto financial ad- additionality, it's like, I'm not sure if that's the, r- the right frame in terms of you're valuing an externality. The, the, if the externality has, has, if there's demand for it, then it should have, it should have a value. Uh, and it, it's odd for me to say renewable electricity is, is clearly good for the environment. So why wouldn't you make the investment case better by 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 valuing the renewable the 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 the, the attribute, um, and I know it's talked about in terms of financial financial additionality and renewables, but it, it's it's a little bit weird how that there's this sort of demand that oh, I, in order to have electricity to be additional, I've got to go and almost finance a, a new renewable plant. But if you if if you're wanting to green your electricity consumption and you buy all the wrecks, then the, there's less supply, so the value of the wreck is going to go up. And so you're going to further incentivize allocation of capital to renewable projects. So that, I, I, I don't get this financial additionality argument in, in renewables in particular. I think it's different in a, it's maybe it's a bit different in, in terms of a project, a carbon credit project where like the only sort of, um, in, you know, in t- if you were like doing a technology removal, then the only revenue stream is really the the carbon credit. So it's a little. So I think it's a little bit different. And renewables, the financial additionality component, I think, is a bit of a bit of a red herring. Yeah, I think it's um, maybe really hydrogen is where 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 it will play a role to also bring in again the renewable discussion back, because we're going to need to build you know, a lot more capacity, especially in places where you have like ample and cheap sun. Um, so we're, we're now currently looking at, because of the hydrogen revolution, uh, in Namibia you have, you know, incredible, like it's like nine billion investment, which is going to double the country's GDP. The GDP of Namibia is nine billion. Uh, so the hydrogen investments income into the country are now also worth nine billion. Uh, this, this is also going to bring, of course, infrastructure, jobs, um, yeah, and, and it will mean that they're going to build a, a lot of renewables um, f- for that reason. So we might see that merging, but I wonder if, 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 if we can see that discussion under Article 6.2 transactions, because a lot of these countries where you have, um, yeah, where you have 
ample sun and wind. Um, they are going to attract hydrogen projects and projects alike, uh, considering the demand from you know massive steel industries like cement, maritime fuel. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna need to electrify all those. Um, so perhaps you know they're going to go under certain art Article 6.2 um, transactions as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, you need all the, you need all the, in terms of um, eroding the green premium, you need all the tools you can get. Uh, environmental markets help, but so do subsidies, you know, feed-in tariffs, um, green bonds. It's all narrowing the green premium between the sort of incumbent technology and, and the new technology. Um, and one thing we haven't re really got into is just, you know, in, from an energy transition perspective, i.e. reducing the CO2 into the atmosphere, it's a massive infrastructure project, right? So the, the, the complexity of it, um, we are talking a little bit, a bit before the panel, the, the amount of dollars that need to be deployed to, to build that infrastructure, you can't just flick a switch and suddenly go, go green. So uh, sometimes it's, it's oversimplified how you actually do uh, an energy transition and the sort of the, the time between the deployment of capital and then the result of it, uh, that, that's another, another challenge. I, th I think the clue is in the fact that, you know, it's a transition. As you said, you, you don't just flick a switch and it happens overnight. These things are going to take time. And, you know, again, I know, especially in Southeast Asia, there's an issue of grid stability and, you know, having very disconnected markets. Um, Mikhail, did you want to add anything to that or...? I'm sure you've got a lot of other things to talk about. But, I mean, you did one example is the TFP transaction that we just saw happening after COP with $20 billion going into Indonesia. I personally think it's pretty brave in the sense that it's obviously decommissioning coal-fired power plants early. It's going to have real savings to the environment. But where the money is going makes it sensitive. Um, so the hope is that the standard setters that generate carbon credits will actually see it for the real impact that they have, and I have faith that they will. Um, something else, and maybe this is maybe going to be a bit more directed at you again, Brett, and I, I promise I'm not picking on you. Um, but obviously there's been a lot of talk and kind of growing talk about concerns about greenwashing. Um, and obviously with financial institutions, there's been a lot of questions about, you know, you've got net zero pledges, but you're still funding fossil fuels or, um, you know, how can financial institutions guard against these accusations? Um, not an easy question to answer on the spot. Um, there's an awful lot of diligence that needs to go into when you're creating new products, right? I think we, uh, we've kind of launched into a lot of ESG product branding, um, on, partly on the back of COVID, et cetera, where there was a rush in, and I think now we're starting to see that there's, you know, there are some faults with with some of the products that have been put out there and some faults with that approach. So um, going forward, I think um, most banks and most financial institutions are gonna probably be a lot more cautious with what they hold out um, as ESG. Um, and I think some of the confusion, at least in Europe, has been created through the, the, some of the labeling and some of the, the, the regulation around around this, which has kind of left some pretty wide fields open for what can be labeled ESG. Um, and that, I think, has helped kind of create the situation we're in. Um, but now that we've seen the backlash, I think a, a lot of financial, institution, financial institutions are listening and uh, will be a lot more cautious going forward as to what they hold out as, as ESG. And Again, I promise I'm not picking on you, Brett, but it's kind of picking up off of that as well. I mean, some of the big, you know, investment alliances, um, like the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero um, and the Asset Manager Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, um, you know, there seems to be a bit of a bit of a cooling or a bit of backing away from things. You know, how important are these efforts to begin with in pushing towards net zero? And if they are really that important, how can they be improved so that we don't get this kind of shying away. Look, they, they serve an, they've, they served an important catalytic role, right? But, and I think where there's been some pushback is that 
Um, there's an attempt to try and march everybody forward at the same pace. And the reality is, is that financial institutions are in different spots in this journey, right? Most of them are, including ourselves, are just trying to get our handle around what our scope three financed emissions are. It's not that straightforward, just like for any corporate out there trying to do the same, it's not easy for us, right? How long is a piece of string? Um, so it takes time to work through those issues. So I think we hesitate on trying to take accountability for things that we can't measure and we can't identify, right? Um, so we understand the, the urgency around the transition and as committed as we are to it, um, it's, the answers are not simple or straightforward. And so you need to give people the flexibility to move at a, at, at, you know, at a reasonable pace. I can add one more thing. I mean, it's it's true um, that financial institutions will have to play a huge role, but what I'm uh, yeah what what we've seen at COP a lot more, you know, banks are going into areas that they they were hesitant before as well. Yes, hydrogen is one of them. So we've seen uh, more support coming from them as well. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the development banks are in emerging economies um, and advising you know, towards a carbon market or an ETS system. Um, and I think that's where we as, you know, carbon market professionals need to have more dialogues with, with these institutions uh, because you also don't want to have, uh, you know, carbon taxation in a country where, where you, you have no idea where those carbon revenues are going. Um, it works great in the EU because you have an innovation fund. So all the carbon taxation goes to the innovation fund, which has now funded the, the, you know, the, the steel plant, the green steel plant's uh, innovation efforts. So without that, it's, it's going to be quite risky. Um, so a lot of the development banks will now be going into uh, you know, funding these projects. I think we need to have conversations with them um, and, and look, uh, look at VCM and revenues thereof as returns as well. Uh, so I'm personally doing doing those conversations with World Bank um, and others, but I think, um, yeah, we we need the banks to also you know acknowledge that uh, that voluntary carbon markets can kickstart the innovation in uh, emerging economies. I think one of the ch the challenges on the on the greenwashing component of it is, um, I guess, it's muting the demand signal for for credits in particular. So organisations would rather. Um, sort of where the the negative press around not compensating for carbon liabilities rather than compensating with a credit and be accused of, of of greenwashing because the credit is allegedly not high quality so that that's sort of dampening the the demand signal um, and and I feel the market is sort of losing the sort of the PR campaign so if the, the, my, my, my current analogy is if if um, you know, environmental markets and carbon markets are like the vaccine uh, for for climate risk. It, the anti-vaxxers are are the loudest, and they're they're kind of winning the argument. And so the industry needs to do a better job in trying to explain the force for good, not just environmental markets, but also financial markets. You know, wh why do we have financial markets? It's to allocate capital and to manage risk. If you can manage risk, it means you can allocate more capital, and if you, if you can't allocate capital for what isn't, for all intents and purpose, uh, you know, trillions of dollars of infrastructure, then you're not going to get to net zero. So the, the, we kind of need to do a better job as an industry to sort of, sort of um, defeat the, the sort of the anti-vaxxer mentality that, that all carbon credits are bad. You know, it's the same with buying any good or service, there's good there's good stuff and there's not so good stuff, but if you're actually in set, you need the good or goods or service, you do your vendor due diligence and you figure out what to, what to buy. Uh, and this all comes down to the incentive. There, there, there's not an incentive to buy, so you'd rather, it's safer for you to sit on the sidelines. And so when people are throwing stones at it, you go, well, I don't really need these, so I'm not gonna go and find out about them. And that, that, that's one of the challenges, I think. Can I just sort of pick up on that sort of greenwashing thing? And uh, I think everybody in the room will have sort of seen the, the, the you know, the, the slings, the, the shots that have been um, sort of levelled at corporates and the, the field day that some media outlets have had. Um, 
and at Trove, we, we work with hundreds of corporates uh, who are um, engaged in their decarbonization journey. And I cannot think of one of them that doesn't genuinely want to do the right thing. So the accusations of greenwashing go company X has sort of is sort of greenwashing their sins and and no the companies want to do the right thing yes they've they've they've, they've got an existing product set you know um, and as has been said earlier you know the infrastructure challenge you can't just flick a switch and decarbonize so the criticism that they they're trying to dupe um, and and sort of wash away their sins is misplaced it's misplaced. Um, because of the, the genuine intention of trying to do the right thing. And when they engage the carbon market and the carbon credit market, they are expecting to buy good stuff. I don't think anybody is saying, ha ha, we got away with it. <laughs> no, they don't operate like that. Every conversation is, starts with, we only want to engage in, you know, in, in, in high quality, robust, defensible stuff. It's the industry, the carbon credits industry's responsibility to respond to that call and reply with products and credits that meet that those criteria. So I think the those those arrows are being fired at the wrong you know at the wrong target. We actually have a report at South Pole called Green Hushing because that's you know that greenwashing has led now companies to just hush and not tell not speak about it. Like they're afraid of you know saying anything and it's even worse because we can't we need like first movers to you know lead and, and show what they're doing. Um, so there's a there's a high risk. Yeah, I recommend our report, Green Hushing. But it, it, also, if you want to get a real life example of how important energy is to prosperity and to economies, then you only got to look at Europe now, where we've seen a massive supply disruption of, of losing, you know, 35 percent of your your hydrocarbon um, supply and. You know, that's causing a lot of pain for individuals and for companies in Europe. You know, the manufacturing industry in Europe is, is, is suffering uh, significantly from a lack of energy. So, again, this goes back to the transition. It's not just a switch. So, quite often, energy companies or, or, or banks financing energy companies are kind of made pariahs, but it's an energy transition. Who has the experience of deploying capital for projects that take years to implement, have high risk, uh, and, 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 and so know how to project manage, they know how to execute, they know how to deploy the capital, they take the risk. You can't make an energy company a pariah if you want to do an energy transition. They have the scientists, they have the engineers, they have the know-how, you know, so that we, we, people need to be a bit more practical. It's a little bit, like everything's good or bad, that's just that's just that's just not that's just not accurate, right? Um, read Vaclav Smil's book, How the World Really Works, and that will sort of explain to you how we rely on on energy for everyday life and prosperity. Can I sort of go back to the um, uh, the the market side of this and pick up on a couple of examples where the voluntary market and the sort of regulated markets sort of overlap in a very, very constructive and helpful way. Um, and this comes along the decarbonization, the pressures to decarbonize are really drawn around sectoral lines. So um, the two examples I want to draw out are the corporate average fuel efficiency standards for vehicles. Now the regulators did get involved in the US and in Europe, but the industries were on board with this as well. Um, so you actually have SUV manufacturers buying credits from electric car manufacturers. And in fact, a good chunk of the subsidies behind, SU behind electric vehicles, behind Tesla, et cetera, have coming from the financing from the SUV manufacturers because they collectively have to achieve a corporate average fuel efficiency standard. And Corsia, the uh, international um, offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, is built along similar lines. All of the airlines are coming together uh, and for international aviation and committing to holding missions levels at 2019 levels. Um, again, it's got the UN backing. But if we can use those as examples to push forward sectoral decarbonization um, groups, can you imagine a global steel industry coming together and saying, we're all going to come together and figure out the correct standards? Those structures, I think, have a huge amount of merit. Um, 
because one of the great things about that, when everyone comes together, if you think about the international aviation scheme and you go back to your basic economic textbooks, there's something called the theory of tax incidence, which means that when everybody sells something together, they can pass those costs through into higher prices. So you'll expect your international aviation costs to go up, but we will end up paying for it, not the industry. And that basically takes a financing mechanism that the industry will support and doesn't cost them that much from a net burden point of view. And you get the carbonized decarbonization and the uh, trading and the carbon credits flowing in as well. So I think those are really good structures. And I, I think that's part of the solution. I couldn't agree more. I think it's crucial. And we're going to for sure see the same uh, in the maritime sector. But let's hope, uh, I, I'm hoping those conversations are happening so that, uh, that they can you know, embrace VCM. Um, so I think that's crucial. I don't know who is leading that in the industry. Um, yeah, and I think there, there's one bar barrier, though, that I, I should say, in a, in, especially for the mitigation uh, credits, not removals, is the SPTI. So many of the you know, manufacturing industries, hard to bait industries, they want to all align with SPTI, um, and they don't count mitigation credits. So um, I think that's another you know, important thing to consider. Um, we should be having conversations with SPTI um, to have, you know, a room, especially for this hard to abate sector that needs to make, you know, an incredible, uh, you know, investment. Often, like steel, it's blast furnaces today. Most of Asia's blast furnaces are new, uh, so you can't just phase them out like that. Uh, it has a huge cost. You need to build a completely new plant. Like you need to, you know, you can't decarbonize a blast furnace. So. For these specific sectors, we need to, you know, nurture one carbon markets, but with SPTI's guidelines, yeah, it's becoming difficult. There's not enough removal, so... I'm just reflecting on some of the comments that, that is being said here and perhaps throwing in a provocative comment. Um, I think it's natural when you come out of a market that has failed once before that you want to make it perfect. Um, so it's, there's so much more upside in being negative around carbon credits. So we set the bar so high, whether it's SPCI, we cannot do anything which is not removal, whether it's a VCMI about the claims that you can make, or any of your other guidance that comes out there, sets the bar at an almost impossible bar to meet. At the same time, we set the bar extremely high for what quality looks like for carbon credits. And that's all fine, we can try and create a market like that. But we cannot at the same time then say that we want money to flow to the countries, which is ultimately trying to protect standing forest, because we don't have the rules of law, we might get it one day, we will not have all those things in place that we expect from developed countries, but we only allow those to be high quality. So you can have either, but I think it's really hard to say that you want both at the same time in a short period of time that we have left for 2030. So we can speak all we want, but, but that's the conundrum I see. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. that there, I think there are, there's a fair few own goals in terms of there's a lot of discussion ab about what's quality. Ultimately, quality is in the eye of the beholder. Um, so, um, you know, the SBTI thing, that, so SBTI, we, we, we've certainly found in terms of our carbon credit auctions, people have used SBTI as a reason not to buy a credit. But I, I think that some of that's a sort of misinterpretation or them not being clear enough. And they have, they have sort of changed their, if you don't read it, if you don't read it well, you can, you can sort of come to the conclusion that you can't really, credits are awful and you can't really use them. They, they have this 10% thing, but the 10% is, if that's business as usual and that's your decarbonization pathway, you can't use more than 10% to meet your pathway. And I would argue you shouldn't use anything to meet your pathway. Um, but everything below the line you should be you should be paying for and they did come out with a I don't think it's an official guidance but it's in a blog which in itself is not helpful because you imagine going to see CEO oh yeah you can the SBTI have now made it clear that you can you, you can compensate and you go okay where's the guidance well it's on their blog um, so it, it needs to be firmer and 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 that sort of lack of clarity is not, again, it's muting the, the demand signal, as is whether it's VCMI, whether it's Integrity Council, you, you know, you're kind of like going, well, if, if something is the Integrity Council, you're almost implying that th this thing over there lacks it, 
and if you don't solve for it, it's uninvestable. But th there's there's good stuff in the market. It's investable today. So there needs to be sort of less talking and, and, and more doing. That's exactly how I feel, to be honest. Um, on that note, actually, we're going to turn over to the audience. We've got about eight minutes left. Um, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'd ask you to please um, introduce yourself and your organization. Um, and if you wanted to direct your question at anyone specific on the panel, or if it's just a general. So you just uh, raise your hand. I think my colleagues at the back have got microphones. Yes, gentlemen down here. Uh. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Theo Hopkins, head of climate change at Petronas. Um, I want to set this scenario in a developing country that is about to, uh, to implement uh, carbon tax. Private companies are allowed to pass the cost of carbon tax to consumers. In that case, who will be paying for the next zero? Consumers or private companies? What happens with the polluter pays principle? Should we rely on the goodwill of private companies or there's something we can do to make them pay for the pollution? Over to you, Gordon. Uh, well, I, so I think polluter pays principle is a good one. Um, and that's the way that cap and trade models are built upon. Now it's up to the polluter whether to pass on that cost or not. Um, you know, effectively, the, the consumer in the UK has, has been paid for pollution through their electricity tariffs. They just, they just don't know it. But it has resulted in abatement. So that, for me, is a good thing. I think one of the challenges on, on counting is, actually, when you go down the route of greenhouse gas protocol, it's not really a polluter pays model. You know, scope one, two, three. As Brett says, that's really hard. Um, and that sort of moves away from a, a polluter pays principle. That's why on the last panel when I was asked what I wanted for Christmas, uh, I, I said I wanted Santa Claus to bring me a global cap and trade program. So if you identify who the polluter is and they have to pay for their pollution, then that's the most effective way of, of incentivizing abatement because you, you're controlling the quality, I mean the quantity and the cap and trade. If you, if you don't comply, you get fined and you still have to pay. So eventually you go out of business. So if you're not abating, you go out of business. Yeah, um, and I think it depends on the product, the sector and the country. Um, because there's really only three levers that um, can be pulled to, to incentivize decarbonization. One is a tax, um, the other is a, a a subsidy and the other is a regulation. Um, and one of the problems with polluter praise principles is uh, it, when you start putting it on energy, in, as I said, some countries are subsidizing energy because of the social um, uh, sort of imperatives of giving what is seen as access to energy as a sort of like a human right. Um, and when you've got high levels of poverty, uh, you know, pricing energy higher becomes socially difficult, politically difficult. So, you know, we, a lot of us live in democratic societies, not all of us. Um, and um, voters don't like to see, um, you know, socially regressive policies that um, put the lower income uh, at a greater disadvantage. Um, so it's the answer i think is quite complicated it depends on the on the con on the um on the country uh and and the context so you know i'm all for fl for polluter place principles on luxury flights you know private jets there's a sort of a, an affordability there um but household energy um you know every time a government wants to introduce fuel duty on petrol at the pump looks great from the economics point of view. Um, but you get the French, was it 10 years ago, the French went out on the streets and started rioting. And we had the same in the UK when the fuel duty went up. Um, so there's the political dimension, which is just needs to be thought through as well. They don't have to be regressive though, because you can ultimately, 
if, if again, government cap and trade, you're raising revenue, you can redistribute wealth. And in California, cap and trade, the, the, the money that they're raising is going into climate action, but also redistributing wealth so that the poorest people still have the, the right that they should have to, to have electricity and, 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 and energy. In a well-structured, in a well-structured functioning economy, that's great. Exactly, I agree. I agree. I think we've probably got time for one more question from the floor. Um, no, okay. Uh, well, in that case, I'd um, ask you all to join me in thanking our panel for the very lively discussion today and giving up their time. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, I'll invite Dirk Forrester and Stefano De Clara um, up to the stage to make their closing remarks. So just thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thanks everyone for uh, sticking with us here to the bitter end. Um, I'm Dirk Forrester, I'm the, the CEO of AIDA, and uh, really it's been a delightful uh, few days with, with all of you, and, and I think what um, uh, Stefano and Christian Hubner and I uh, wanted to do is kind of just give you a, a bit of a, uh, some takeaways from our vantage point as the co-organizers on this. And um, Christian's actually not with us in person, but he's with us online. And Christian, I wanted to give you the, the chance to say a few words first about, uh, uh, and, and also to thank you for the uh, cooperation on this, uh, this event. Uh, he's with the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And um, Christian, why don't, why don't I pass to you just for a few closing observations. Uh, thank you, Dirk, for uh, introducing me and uh, first let me thank the organizer uh, panelists and and participants for having such a wonderful uh, conference uh, today. Um, I, I tried to follow all the um, discussion and I, again I learned so much and it was again really a pleasure to have this kind of uh, cooperation with IETA and uh, ICAP and the International Energy um, Organization. Yeah, reflecting everything within five minutes is such a uh, huge challenge. But uh, what 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 I my my personal takeaway is a bit that um, <clears throat> we are facing so many different um, uh, discussion streams in the field of carbon markets at the same time. Uh, we have all this complexity uh, increasing in the field of mandatory markets and the voluntary markets. We have all these uh, new national developments in Asia Pacific in terms of new carbon pricing uh, mechanism. We have the whole new topic of uh, climate uh, data infrastructure, blockchain technology. Um, and, and there's so much more going on here uh, that it might be sometimes happen that you forget why, why you're doing all these exercises. So I think it's really important to, to have this always in mind. Uh, the final objective is to reduce carbon uh, emission. And that's why we have all these uh, mechanisms that sometimes are very complex. Uh, but anyway, they all have their uh, meaning and they are very important. But this is a bit my, my personal takeaway here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Stefano for the same. So I'll pass to Stefano to Clara with ICAP. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. And um, I guess this is the, the third um, event that uh, we've, the, we've done in this uh, series. So I also wanted to reflect a little bit on, uh, you know, what we learned in um, in uh, in the process, and so we had the first one in in New York, looking at uh, North America. We had one in Rio, uh, looking at Latin America, and now we are here uh, for the Asia Pacific. And the the beauty of uh, you know having a a series of uh, events is that. Uh, I can basically make the, the same closing remarks three times, and people don't uh, don't notice. 
Uh, no, but all kidding is apart, uh, the, the first point I wanted to make, and this is actually something that I already brought up in uh, Rio, um, is that um, you know, carbon markets are uh, a really diverse and complex uh, tool, and they do require a diversity of uh, skill set and backgrounds uh, to come together to actually be implemented and, uh, and work. And in, the, you know, in that context, uh, I'm really glad that uh, we, as uh, ICAP and as a network of uh, governments, could partner up with AITA, a network of uh, companies, and also with other partners to, uh, to bring different stakeholders together in different uh, regions. And I think it, uh, it worked quite nicely as a format to, to discuss and, uh, and learn from, uh, from each other. Um, in terms of you know, what we actually learned on, uh, on Substance, uh, I think you know, it's fair to say that uh, Right now, we're, we're at the stage where uh, there are systems that have been in operation for a number of years now. Those uh, jurisdictions where they operate uh, adopted the net zero commitments in the, in, the, in, the, in the meantime. And now they are starting the, the reform process to actually think about how they can use their uh, emission trading systems or carbon pricing tools to actually get to, to net zero. And that is uh, uncharted territory, obviously, for, for everyone. And, uh, I think it's quite interesting to uh, you know come together at these events and uh, and see how that uh, process is going in uh, in different uh, places. Um, and the flip side of it is that there are also countries, especially in the Asia Pacific and in LATAM, that uh, did adopt a net zero commitment, but they still don't have the the underpinning uh, policy tools to uh, to get there. Um, and so what they're doing now is to basically come up with. Uh, the tools that they need and the carbon pricing tools that they need to to reach their net zero commitments, and um, you know, like when we had these discussions in uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, a few years ago, like the whole discussion was about whether they should go for an ETS or a carbon tax, and that was uh, it, right? Uh, whereas now uh, the landscape is way more uh, diverse, and uh, you have uh, countries that uh, do you know a combination of an ETS and a carbon tax. At the same time, they might also look at uh, crediting systems to cover some uh, sectors, and that and that also happens across the compliance dimension and the uh, the voluntary one. So there's much more in the mix, and obviously, uh, there's much more that we can learn from each other on how that uh, can be configured to uh, to actually operate. And I think in that context, uh, these events worked out quite uh, quite nicely. Thanks, Stefano, and um, it really has been a, a thrill collaborating uh, again over the uh, over the course of this year uh, on these events. Now, I'll, I'll just say, uh, um, for this particular event, um, we started where where the point that Christian underscored uh, with a conversation about net zero and about what what does it actually take for for we as a community to do our part in contributing for to that overall effort. And really, I hope that it's come out of the conversations here that really carbon markets are part of the net of net zero because we are the, the community that helps to bring together in, in a systemic way the, the money, the technology, the innovation, the ideas uh, that can actually enable us to get to net zero. Um, no individual company can do it alone. Very few countries can do it alone. Um, we need to cooperate across borders, across sectors, um, and we need all of the best and brightest uh, involved in this to be able to harness those reductions and bring them to market and raise the investment that's needed to get us there. And so that's fundamentally what all of this is about. Um, I think this, uh, somebody asked me in the hallway earlier about um, uh, sort of the, 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 these forums always have so much on technology. And I was like, no, it's, it's actually, this has been a, a phenomenal one in that regard because I think over the, the past several months, the, the power of uh, tapping into blockchain technologies, for example, has really uh, started to find its place in the, in the carbon market universe. So certainly the launch of the data trust uh, or the trust as we're starting to call it uh, is a, is a a huge step forward, and many thanks to all of you who have uh, been supportive of, of developing the ideas behind that. 
um, having the tremendous support, not only from the World Bank, but from the government of Singapore on that, and uh, enabling AIDA to, uh, to actually accelerate our work on this and to establish an office here in Singapore, which is our ambition in the, in the next 90 days, uh, that we would be able to uh, help to really take that data trust forward, but also to support all of you in this room that are a part of building markets in Asia, because that's where a lot of the growth is, that's where a lot of the emissions are, that's where a lot of the netting potential is, so there really is a lot that we can do together. Um, I also am uh, struck by, uh, I have one friend that works for a billionaire. Um, you guys all probably have lots of friends that work for a billionaire, but, but this friend says that the billionaire always asks the question, how? And I think as we approach the net zero debate, that frankly, a lot of it is about the how, and market solutions really have a lot of the answers to the how. It's not the only answer by any means, but it is the answer for giving business that system of incentives to invest more and to become partners with governments, partners in this cause of getting to, uh, getting to the, the Paris goals. Um, so uh, I want to close just by, by bringing it all back to those thoughts and um, also to offer a few thank yous. I've already thanked uh, uh, Stefano and Christian, but obviously there's a whole set of uh, partner sponsors of these events that have helped make this uh, successful. There's also a team at AIDA, uh, some of whom are in this room. Would you guys stand up, the AIDA team, that have helped to deliver this? Lisa, everyone knows, but uh, yes. Uh, and uh, like absolutely none of them stood up. Did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, at least I did. Um, but uh, also, just to um, the members of AIDA who uh, support us in all of this, uh, who are so committed and are, um, they are as committed as anyone in, in delivering this uh, net zero aim. So with that, I am pleased, oh, I've got three more minutes on the clock. No, I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to let you leave three minutes early, uh, but really a big thank you to all of you, uh, the attendees who have, have come together for this. And we will be back for another edition of, uh, of the Asian Climate Summit next year. We'll be announcing the where and when soon, uh, but uh, please come back and, and uh, join us next year. Thanks again, and a final round of applause for everyone that's been participating. Thank you.